Uh, my name is Elizabeth Papadopoulos. I'm the director of the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. It's my honor and joy to be with you this morning. And thank you to all of you for joining us for our open house. Um, our first faculty member and speaker is Eva Kabaka. Eva holds a master's of education degree and has an extensive background in teaching. She holds diplomas with honors in natural health counseling, applied holistic nutrition and herbal medicine. Eva is a 1998 graduate of the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. She brings a blend of traditions and skills to her practice and her teaching. She is a registered nutritional consulting practitioner and director of Live Nutrition Cooking School. She is inspired by her life's mission, where she is involved in teaching biodynamic gardening throughout the GTA. She conducts several public herb walks and cooking classes. Her life passions include spreading the knowledge of simple, whole living, spirituality, care for the environment, as well as a rigorous yoga practice. She is the author of Earthly and Divine, Whole Recipes for a Healthy World, and Eva teaches holistic food preparation, nutrition in the environment, herbal medicine at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. So welcome, Eva Kabaka. Okay, wonderful. Very nice to be with you all today. And uh, our topic is biodynamic gardening. So I'm going to start sharing my slides here. So here we are, nutrition and the environment. This is one of the courses I teach at the IHN and it's very close to my heart because the environment we share all and it's inspiring us all. And of course we cannot escape from it. And I always say what we cannot escape from, we better befriend so that it's not our enemy, but it is really our dearest friend. And we can always fall upon nature to support us. Even through our very uh, hard times, sometimes when you look out, I just sent today a picture of a bee, actually a video of a bee pollinating my cosmos flowers to my friends. And they were just so delighted. And they said, okay, well, this is all I need for the day. I don't need anything else today because this is just so inspiring and enjoyable. So we are going to talk about biodynamic gardening and we are going to talk a, a lot about these connections, the observation, the feeling, the emotions that we have in our gardens, not just really the uh, benefits, the material benefits, but also whatever inspires us and gives us joy. But of course, we have to think of the rewards as well. That comes with it. Because if you do something and you don't have a reward, of course, you can get discouraged. And I can tell you that through a lot of scientific research, there is evidence that biodynamic produces superior nutrition. And actually, this year, we are celebrating 100 years of biodynamic agriculture. So you can see that uh, Rudolf Steiner is the founder of biodynamic agriculture and gardening because not too many of us actually have farms. Some of us may have hobby farms and that's excellent. But I am just going to speak to really what you can do in your small backyard garden or even on your balcony for that matter or on your windowsill in the kitchen. So it's actually applicable to everyone, no matter what your living situation is. So we are looking at this 100 year old legacy that started with Rudolf Steiner, who was a mystic. And uh, he was a great teacher as well, philosopher, but also a scientist. And he blended all of that very skillfully so that he could guide people through various areas of practical life. So Rudolf Steiner also founded Waldorf Education. And some of you might be familiar with that. Waldorf schools are around the world and they produce beautiful, well-rounded human beings. 
who can delve then into anything that they can choose to. So it is really nice to see how the human skill can thrive this way as well. And of course, we can apply our human skill to farming and gardening as well. And it all starts with more of a spiritual approach to all life, not just materialistic approach, always try to see the rewards in it and the yield and um, some sort of a material benefit. But uh, we are also able to really observe in our garden, work with our intuition, with emo our emotions, some of the higher faculties that we may not even be fully aware that we have, because we really have that new human being emerging these days. And we haven't tapped into our full potential yet. We really have to get there. And the more we cultivate this kind of approach and be open to all kinds of possibilities and really get inspired from nature and by nature, the more quickly we can actually develop. So in biodynamics, we are talking about a science of life forces, the formative forces that form our human body, but also form everything in nature. So there, there are rhythms in nature that are busy at work all the time. And there are rhythms, of course, that surround the planet. So we are not really confined only to the Earth as our home, but we are really expanding our awareness into the whole cosmos and we are tapping into the potential of the whole cosmos so that the cosmic forces through the planets and through the constellations can actually make an imprint here that will have profound effect on balance and healing the soil and all the life forms that exist through the nutrition that is derived from the soil. And it is really based on observation, intuition, and experience. So we are cultivating these old time-tested faculties that we have. Of course, biodynamics is backed up with a lot of research. And if you go into that, and if you Google a lot of websites, you can see that there is actually very solid research about biodynamics. But that is really just reconfirmation what we already feel through our intuition and through our observation and through our direct experience as we walk through the fields and gardens. So it's just not the methods and techniques that we embark on, but also that deep connectiveness with uh, our environment. So then a few other basics so that we really understand the principles of um, biodynamic gardening and agriculture. So we know that life is a simple, seamless tapestry and all the threads are necessary. Sometimes we call it the web of life, right? Where we have really those profound connections and all the threads are necessary for maintaining balance. So nature has really this beautiful ability to maintain and support balance. And we can see the brilliance and power that comes through that. And uh, it informs then how the soil works so that it can fundamentally support the plants. And of course, what feeds the soil are, is all the life within the soil, something that we can observe perhaps, but even more so the microbial life. And everybody understands now how microbial life is really important, if, even for our own bodies. Everybody is talking about the microbiome in our own gut, but we have to really start talking about the microbiome in the soil first, because that supports the microbiome in our body. 
So we are also talking about the balance between the elements, which is also very ancient knowledge, when we recognize that everything really operates through the uh, five great elements. So we have the ether, the air, the fire, earth, and water, which are individually essential, of course, but collectively very powerful. We have to consider sunlight, the temperature, the rain, and um, the structure of the soil. And then we also consider, of course, the cosmic forces of the planets and constellations around us, which definitely influence all the elements and conditions for growing. So the grower not only nurtures the soil and plants, but she herself or he himself would be an intricate part of the growing experience. So um, the farmer or the gardener themselves is really important as an individuality as well. And very much involved. And this is the best time actually to talk about biodynamics because you can start literally dreaming into the future. And people always ask me, when is the best time to start my garden? And I said, right away. Don't work for, don't wait for the correct season or whatever. No matter what the season, you can start already preparing your soil and also preparing your mind for, for what you really want to do in that space. But when we are transitioning into fall, that's really probably one of the best, most auspicious times to start cultivating the soil. Because when you do enrich the soil with compost and microbial life and various elements and so forth, and then we go into winter, into the period of rest where everything can blend together and balance, then in the spring, you have the best quality soil that you can start actually growing something in. So it's a great time to start. Don't wait until the spring because you have missed all that time off what I call dreaming. It's really the dreaming that we do. We imagine what we want in our gardens. And I'm always blown away because whenever I want something in my garden, there is a specific herb that I, I would really like to have in my garden. I kind of invite it in my thoughts and it appears in, in, in the material in my garden. And I haven't even planted it there. It just comes because the seeds are everywhere. And they just need to arrive. So there would be an insect, there would be a bird, there will be something that is actually going to drop the seed into your garden and start the plant. It's quite amazing. Of course, you cannot do it all the time because we have to start our plants and uh, transplant them and cultivate them in our gardens. But the dreaming is really a very interesting and intricate part of it as well. We are also involved with uh, observation when we can get deeper insights into our challenges and also our solutions because sometimes you have bugs, you have various problems and all that can be actually mitigated through biodynamics as well. So the essential theme of biodynamic agriculture or gardening is interconnectedness between the sky and the earth, between the microbe and uh, the plant, the plant and the soil, and also the human and the plant and the soil, ultimately as well. And your role as an observer, as the steward of the land, is just as crucial as your role as active participant. And your inner nature also affects your outer world. So when we cultivate literally our own garden within our body, we can actually express it outwards. 
as well. And we can extend it to the community around as well. Many people, when they go for a walk here, they stop by my garden. And when I am out, or if I am out, they always comment how much they love my garden. And that's because I have invited all kinds of herbs and species in my front. I just have my herb garden and I grow beautiful things in there. I wouldn't grow nettles and burdock and things that don't really look that great. And also nettles sting you and burdock produces those burrs that are nuisance, right? So you want to have flowers, but also the kind of flower that is medicinally useful perhaps as well, such as yarrow and chamomile and hyssop and echinacea. And all those are incredibly beautiful plants and they will attract your pollinators and your butterflies and it's going to bring you a lot of joy. So now the core principles of biodynamics. So first of all, nature is your guide. As we already mentioned, nature has that innate power and intelligence to support balance in the world. We also follow cosmic rhythms. So we know that planets and stars have deep, profound influence on processes on Earth. We, need, we see it in tides. We see it in the female menstrual cycle. We see it with the alteration of night and day, of course. We see it with the diminishing sunlight and increasing sunlight through various seasons. So it's very obvious that there are profound planetary and uh, stellar influences on our environment. And understanding these cosmic rhythms actually allows us to make intelligent choices so that we don't do things randomly, but we really understand when the best time for doing certain tasks in the garden arrives. And then, of course, we are going to cultivate beautiful quality of food, which is going to also support our human energy. So when you start consuming things from your garden, you are actually going to strengthen all those various faculties that I already talked about, the faculty of observation, intuition, and being really uh, in sync with what's going on in nature. Your garden is also an individuality, the basic unit. And it's a good idea to supply it with its basic requirements to provide fertility. So we practice very specialized way of composting. We invite diversity of crops. So we definitely don't want monoculture in our garden. We want to have our garden as diverse as possible. And oftentimes you can blend your herbs and vegetables together. I actually grow kale in my front herb garden. And in the spring, the second year plant produces very tall stalk and beautiful yellow flowers. And there's hardly anything in anybody's garden as tall and flowering at that early springtime. And I already have beautiful yellow flowers and people walk around and see like, what's going on? What, what, she, what does she have there? And you might tell them kale that is going to flower. Wow. Okay. Never heard of that. <laughs> so you can really be very creative with the space that you are gardening in. Because your presence, your ego is going to matter in that space. Because you make the choices. And then we work with various preparations. So back to compost production, we have specific preparations and we are going to see them in the next slide, which are actually used in our compost. And these are various herbs 
that enhance nutrient availability in the soil. In biodynamic agriculture, what's also produced is horn manure. And that's literally cow manure that is stuffed in a female cow horn and buried in the ground for the time of cold season. So through October to April, we actually keep that buried in the soil. And then in the spring, you take it out and you shake out beautiful composted matter that does not smell a wee bit. It has completely transformed in the soil. And that has beautiful forces within it that can start enlivening in the spring the garden space. Sort of help to wake up the garden space. And then we have horn silica, which is made from good quality quartz crystal, which is powdered and also put in the cow's horn through the warmer season so that it invites the warmth elements. And therefore, the capacity of the garden to receive light. You may have noticed that we have less sunlight these days. There are forest fires that blanket the um, sky sometimes. And um, it's cloudy quite a bit as well. And um, the more sunlight, of course, we can invite in our gardens, the better because green plants really thrive on sunlight. They're nourished by sunlight. The process of photosynthesis definitely needs fundamentally sunlight for it to proceed. And then lastly, there is also emphasis on mutual benefits and profitability. So what are the mutual benefits? Well, the garden gives you joy, pleasure, beauty, nutrition for your soul as well. And of course, the pollinators and the various insects and your earthworms and whatever you are cultivating in there is really very, very beneficial for the whole environment. But there should also be immediate benefit to you as the gardener and your family so that you can really grow beautiful quality food. That's your reward and it should be definitely expected. That material reward as well. So there is a reward for the soul, but there is also a reward, material reward for the body at the same time. And they need to go hand in hand. Again, they need to be balanced properly so that we see that we actually do have also this material benefit to ourselves and our families as well. So now about the preparations. So I already talked about the horn manure that enlivens soil in the spring. And I already talked about the horn silica as well, which is the quartz that brings in the light element. And you can see that they're all numbered. So you have BD500 and BD501, which is the horn manure, horn silica. And then there are various compost preparations. And these compost preparations are prepared with herbs, as you can see them here. So it's quite interesting. And this morning I was actually busy making compost tea for my garden again. I've done that many times already. Yesterday, the garden received um, 
tea of my lavender plants because I cut my lavender plants. I have many lavender plants and I cut those lavender plants and I infuse them in rainwater and I left it for about three days and it smells divine. It's a very strong tea that I make for my plants. So you can heal plants with other plants or make them strong so that they feel really fundamentally supported. So my herb garden is a great space for growing healing plants for my clients and for myself, and that's excellent, of course. But there are many plants that I don't use because nature is so abundant that you always have more than what you can use. So the more I actually apply back to the garden. So I make that tea and then I strain the liquid and I water my plants with it. And the garden responds beautifully to that tea. So um, here though, we have the biodynamic preparations that would be actually used in the compost. So that's a little bit different. So when you have a compost pile, or you have your compost in your compost bin, which is something that is available to us home gardeners. Never put your scraps at the curb to be picked up. That's a lot of waste for you. You should be using them for your own space, for your own garden, especially if you eat organic vegetables. So you definitely have to have a few compost bins. One is not enough. And people always say, oh, what about the rodents? What about this and that? They will not come if you observe some very simple rules. And one of them, one of the most important ones is that you don't put meat scraps in there because that can attract raccoons and uh, whatnot. But if you just put vegetable matter in, then no problem whatsoever. You can definitely do that. And uh, it's not going to be bothered because the raccoon is going to go to your neighbors that are sloppy enough to actually eat the garbage out and whatever. There's so much for them to feed on. They will nef definitely not bother your vegetable scrap compost. And uh, when we uh, have the bins in place and when um, they are full, we can actually put in these preparations. These preparations are prepared in a very specific way. And I don't make them myself. I actually order them from the Biodynamic Society. Or if I have the time, and if it fits in my schedule, I actually go to the workshop. I participate in making the preparations. It's a lot of fun. And then I can actually take some home as a reward. So you can find out where the Biodynamic Society is around you. So if you are in Ontario, you're just going to say Biodynamics Ontario, and you're going to be directed to the website of the Ontario Biodynamic Association, and you're going to see what uh, educational opportunities there are and various workshops and how you can order your compost preparations as well. If you are in BC, you just Google Biodynamics British Columbia, and you are going to get your um, hits there as well. All right, so Rudolf Steiner came up with these particular herbs as the great healers and enhancers of the quality of our compost. So first of all, we have yarrow, which is, again, my favorite herb for many reasons, because it's such a great healer for everything. And uh, yarrow is um, great for attracting all trace elements into the garden. So I hope we are back on. 
Elizabeth, is there... Hi, a... Yeah, we're back on. Okay, if you can just uh, continue from, from this slide, yeah? From this slide, so I have to repeat this slide completely, or can I yes. just... Continue? Yeah, if you could repeat this slide, that would be perfect. Okay, great, yes. Yes, so I uh, wanted to introduce you to a few of the biodynamic preparations. So I already talked about the horn manure, and I already talked about the horn silica. And these are used to enliven the soil in the spring and also in the summer when we want to attract a little bit more heat. And then we have specific preparations for the compost. So it's very important to have your composter set up which will enable you to um, make great quality in um, amendment for your garden. And especially if you eat organic vegetables, it's a great idea, of course, to compost them yourself. Don't put them at the curb. It's really not that great because uh, you want to utilize them yourself and make the best possible amendment for your garden. So when the compost is finished, you introduce these herbal preparations. And uh, you can get them through the Biodynamic Society. So if you are in Ontario, you can Google Biodynamics Ontario and you're going to uh, be directed to the Biodynamic Society of Ontario. If you live in BC, uh, you can say Biodynamics British Columbia and again, they will direct you to uh, the appropriate um, organization that supports biodynamics in BC. These are throughout the country, throughout the world. So don't worry, you will definitely always be able to find your resources. So Rudolf Steiner came up with these specific herbs that would be useful to enhance the quality of your amendment, of your compost. So first of all, we have yarrow which is actually a great healer in human herbal medicine as well. And uh, yarrow is uh, the next biodynamic preparation. It actually enhances the access to all trace minerals. So all trace minerals are enhanced by yarrow and uh, all trace minerals are actually needed for plants. Then we have chamomile that very strongly balances nitrogen in the soil. And nitrogen, of course, is very important for growing green leaves. It's the element that uh, is really needed for development of protein structures, of course. It's the signature element in proteins, and it's going to grow beautiful foliage on your plants. Then we have stinning nettle, which also works with all elements, but especially iron. And iron, again, is an element that's very much needed in the soil and in plants. And of course, it gives us strength because it builds our blood, red blood cells. And then we have uh, our oak bark which works with uh, silica and uh, potassium. And these are very important for building structures in plants. Again, uh, silica and potassium both are excellent for development of a strong stalk that can support the plant. And oak bark is also excellent uh, to build resilience to various diseases or resistance to various diseases. Then we have dandelion that also works with the elements of silica and potassium, attracting them into the soil so that plants can work with them better. And then we have valerian, which is the light 
bearing kind of plant because it works with phosphorus. So when you want to increase again the absorption of light and warmth by the plants, then um, the valerian preparation is very good for that. And then we have horsetail or equisetum, which um, is great for preventing diseases in the garden. So when you have various molds and powdery mildew and whatever can build up in your garden, then the equisetum preparation is great for that. And you can even make tea, just like I suggested, that you can make that tea for your garden. You can make that with horsetail as well. And uh, it prevents um, the um, various fungal diseases. So when it rains a lot in a season, such as it did actually this summer, then you will celebrate that because you have a lot of moisture in your garden. But the downside of that could be that sometimes there will be mold developing. So Equisitum is uh, very good to restore the balance. Okay. So now we have applied that beautiful compost enriched with these herbs on our land. And I just wanted to show you what you are going to see as a result. Because oftentimes the health of your soil can be judged by the weeds that grow on it. It may sound weird, but it is really true. So when you observe what weeds grow in your garden, and I can tell you these are actually not weeds. I eat them. I eat them all the time because they are very nutritious. So there are some very nutritious weeds that will thrive in good, balanced soil. So I'm giving you examples of these plants right here. So first, you're going to have lamb squatters all over your garden, especially if you have a lot of nitrogen, balanced nitrogen in your garden. So lamb squatters, they look like this. And um, it's a beautiful edible plant especially when you have the young stage of that plant, as you can see that on the left here. It's tastier than spinach, guaranteed. And then later, as you can see on the right, it's going to produce the seed heads and the seeds of lamb squatters. If you had the patience to collect them, can be utilized as well. You can actually add, you can grind them and you can add um, that powder into your baking flour. Then we have pigweed, wild amaranth. So this is a plant related to the cultivated amaranth. So this is wild amaranth, oftentimes called pigweed. And that is also a beautiful edible plant, very green, very lush when it's young, very tender as well and great for your nutrition as well, enhancing your own nutrition as well, because uh, all these green plants have a lot of protein as well. You would be surprised how satisfied you feel when you eat them. And then we have something called chickweed. That's our Stellaria. So Stellaria media, and it looks very beautiful. It's called Stellaria because the little white flowers look like little stars against the canopy of the green leaves. So it's really beautiful to look at. It's very succulent, I would say. So it gives you a lot of uh, beautiful, um, uh, soft feeling with which you can actually heal your gut as well. Chickweed is very important for healing, also for healing wounds. You may have seen chickweed salves sold in health food stores as well. So it's a beautiful healing plant and delicious as well. You can put the young leaves again in your wild salads and whatnot, and they are very, very tasty. 
And last but not least, we have common purslain. And uh, purslain is the hidden secret of the Mediterranean diet. People sometimes don't know what makes it so special, but there are actually a lot of herbs and a lot of wild plants that they utilize that um, have very good nutrition. So this one actually has omega-3 fatty acids. And again, it's very tender and almost succulent as well. So beautiful, again, for healing your gut, for beautiful, concentrated nutrition as well. So these would be the plants that are going to just appear miraculously, you could say, in your well-balanced soil. So that's how you can judge the health of your soil. You don't really have to invest in expensive um, soil testing equipment or anything like that. You just observe. Remember, observation is really important in your garden. And you're going to see that these plants have emerged when you have balanced and enriched your soil. So lastly, I'm going to talk about the biodynamic planting calendar. So we say timing is everything. So this is the current biodynamic calendar. You may be familiar with uh, the farmer's almanacs that are still published, right? The old tradition, the old tradition knowledge. Um, and oftentimes you do have references to various planetary and stellar influences, of course. So here we are really focusing on that. So that we know what to plant when, really important, or even what seedlings to start when. Because we are tracking critical solar, lunar, lunar, stellar events for our gardening success. So as planets travel in front of the zodiac, they focus energetic impulses coming from these constellations. And so, of course, everything is constantly changing. The moon position, of course, is very important to observe as well as it relates to the position of the constellation. So applying this knowledge enables you to work in harmony with stars, planets, plants, and of course, the land as well. So let's go within the calendar a little bit. So I am showing you the current page. So we are in August 2024. Today is the 24th of August, and we can see that the main influence is the influence of Aries for us today. And Aries, yes, if you know anything about astrology, Aries is connected with warmth. It's one of those um, constellations that um, is connected with the element of fire together with Leo and Sagittarius as well. And therefore, today is the best day to cultivate or even harvest our fruits. So if you want to harvest tomatoes, for instance, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have also ascending moon. And I don't have time to really talk about all those aspects but in the time of ascending moon, we also have increased nutritional quality. So today is one of the best days to harvest your tomatoes and even make paste or can them or whatever you do. So for the rest of the day, you can do some of that if you do grow some uh, fruits. And of course, uh, doing it with berries or any kind of fruit that we can harvest in our garden is going to be a great idea. If you want to cultivate your plants or if, you're gonna, if you want to pick off um, some of the suckers, some of the shoots of your tomato plants, also do it today in the time of Aries. 
And uh, you can see that in a few days, we are going to go into Taurus tomorrow afternoon already. And Taurus is related to the element of Earth, together with Virgo and Capricorn as well. So that supports the development of root and also the nutritional quality of your root crops. So tomorrow afternoon, you can consider harvesting your carrots. And when we are starting seeds, we pay attention to that as well. So we start the carrot seeds in the um, phase that um, is connected with the element of earth. We start our fruit crops in the phase that's connected with the element of fire and so forth. So you can see that you have it beautifully outlined in the calendar. This particular calendar is published through the Heart and Soil magazine. So remember, Heart and Soil magazine. This is what the cover of the calendar looks like. And um, you can order it for next year already. I was on the website and uh, they already take pre-orders for 2025. So um, this is all I wanted to cover today. I hope you enjoyed a little window into biodynamics. I just scratched the surface. There's so much to talk about. There's so much to expand upon, but um, just a little taste so that you can see that we can actually go beyond just avoiding putting chemicals on our land but we can really focus our energies and uh, work with the energies of the cosmos as well. So I hope you enjoyed and uh, back to Elizabeth. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Eva. I absolutely loved when you were talking about the, uh, the interconnectedness of everything. That was just uh, so moving and so touching because it's so true. Uh, even what we connect with internally, it is always uh, part of the whole process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. As the inner, so is the outer, right? For sure. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Beautiful. So Eva, if you could just um, highlight a couple of uh, elements that you discuss in Nutrition and the Environment and the course that you teach in the program. Right, yes. So right now, um, in the self-paced, actually, there are two options. We have the in-class and we have the self-paced. So um, we definitely start with the soil and the connection of the human being with the soil, the plants with the soil. And of course, uh, what builds healthy soil builds healthy plant and then in return builds healthy human body. So we have these interconnectedness uh, uh, aspects here as well. And uh, the microbes, we talk about the microbes as well, which are the initiators of all the processes in the soil and in nature as well. And uh, we go into basics of organic farming, but not only that, but also permaculture and biodynamic farming so that people understand the differences. Because oftentimes you are asked those questions like, why is it different? Mm -hmm. uh, what it act, what makes it different, right? And it's a good idea to understand that so that you can answer um, questions that people might have for you. And uh, then we go into the environment as we see the air quality and our food quality as it is offered to us through the supermarket or some of those processed foods, right? And see. Um, what changes actually happen there from the whole food that you can pick in your backyard through the processing and everything that happens in the factories. And then it's fed back to us with various additives and chemicals that may be um, used as well. And we are going to learn how these might affect human health as well. And... Um, we talk about the chemicals in the environment as well, which we have 
plenty of, of course, these days. Yeah. So we are going to talk about the uh, various chemicals that we are exposing ourselves to, sometimes intentionally, because you need to clean your home. You need to uh, uh, make everything beautiful for yourself. You have to wash your clothes and you have to take care of yourself, of your body as well, right? And for that, you can use various products. And uh, we will look into what there is, again, in these products and how we can make them as safe as possible for our bodies so that we can achieve really what we want to do and not what we unintentionally not want to actually expose our bodies to. So we go through all that and um, we have a lot of fun with that because the final assignment also uh, makes people to actually reflect on what they are really exposed to. Honestly, they will look into all walks of life and uh, see what's there lurking in your pantry and in your bathroom and uh, in your um, closet and whatnot. And uh, you will critically evaluate what um, hazard it can actually have for your health and well-being. Spectacular. Okay, well, thank you to everyone that attended Eva's lecture today. So we uh, put all of the participants' names that attended Eva's lecture uh, into a wheel. And the winner for an e-version of uh, Eva's incredible book, Earthly and Divine, is... Mayara Carvalho. Congratulations, Mayara. Okay, so we will connect you with Eva and uh, Eva will get you that uh, ebook. And this book is um, also the required uh, textbook that we use in the holistic food preparation classes that Eva teaches. Uh, so whether you are interested in our our live online program um, or our self-paced program, uh, the book is definitely applicable to both. And in the uh, live online program, you would have Eva Kabaka as your faculty member uh, and everything is taught live and in real time. So it's 10 to 2 Eastern and also 10 to 2 Pacific. And we also have a replay, uh, which is exactly what was taught that day. And it's replayed for the evening at 6 to 9.30. So if you actually miss the class, you could catch that replay um, or study in the evening with us if you do work full time. And then the self-paced option allows you to study at your own pace at any time. Uh, so if you would like to have a program advising session with any one of our program advisors uh, for any detailed information on the program, uh, we can provide that as well. And I'm going to put that uh, link right into the chat. Okay, so let us know um, if there are any final questions uh, for Eva. And uh, Mayara says, thank you so much. She's so happy, Eva, for the book. <laughs> uh, that's wonderful news. And thank you, Eva, for being with us here today. Uh, we pray you, that you have a beautiful rest of your Saturday. Um, again, Eva teaches the herbal medicine course at IHN. She teaches holistic food preparation. She teaches Ayurveda and uh, also nutrition, the environment, which she uh, presented on today with the biodynamic organic gardening. And uh, that, is, uh, that is a wrap for Eva Kabaka today. So thank you so much, Eva. All right. Thank you all. And uh, have a great rest of your day as well. <laughs> Bye, Eva. Bye.